couple minutes past seven, so let's go ahead. The lights are coming out up outside, and it is a beautiful evening. Um, welcome to Las Vegas and to the 2024 JRCLS Annual Conference. Um, I'm Kristen Gertie Kyle, Conference Chair, and it's my pleasure to be the first to welcome you to UNLV's Thomas and Max Center the home of the Rebin Running Rebels, which is a little bit weird for me to say because I'm a true blue BYU Cougar. <laughs> but for the last two years, I have been a running rebel um, and this has been home. Um, I'm grateful to be with you and to welcome you to our annual conference. We'll begin tonight's session with an invocation by Sierra Bergquist, who is a 1L at UNLV's William S. Boyd School of Law. We will then have a brief welcome from Dave Garner, our international chair, and then we will hear from Todd Plew, chief judge of the 22nd Judicial District of Colorado, who will present the J. Clifford Wallace Award, and will then introduce tonight's speakers. After our speakers, the invocation will be given by another of our wonderful law students, Warren Wood, a 2L at the University of Wyoming. After our program tonight, we invite you to enjoy each other's company and some delicious desserts. Sierra. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we're all able to be gathered here this evening for this conference. Heavenly Father, please bless that the Spirit will be with us and will guide the words of those speaking to us. And we're so grateful for all of the great minds gathered to be able to speak throughout this conference. And please bless that they will be able to speak with the Spirit to help us know how we can go and do and serve in our communities and build them up. Um, please bless that they will be able to speak with thy influence and that they will be able to speak boldly. And we're so grateful for the opportunity for all of us to be here. And we are so grateful for thee and thy son, Jesus Christ. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the annual conference of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. We express great appreciation to Kristen Gertie Kyle and her committee for all of their hard work in putting together the conference. Grateful for the, our venue and, and all who are providing hosting uh, uh, se sessions for us to, to uh, gather together. Uh, it's, it's in meetings like this that I really get a, a sense of the power of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. When I look at this room and the, and the people who are here, all of you uh, have, have accomplished great things in your career, uh, in your lives, uh, in both the legal profession and, and in your personal lives, in your, in your service. Uh, as a J. Reuben Clark Law Society, we are a, a, a band of volunteers uh, and, uh, and, and the power that we bring to the law and in our individual lives is something that you feel very strongly at a conference like this. There's really no other event that the Law Society puts on where you get to interact with each other in this kind of capacity. And, uh, and hopefully over the next few days as you're here, you will feel that spirit and it will inspire you to continue to devote time and energy and effort to the great mission of the Law Society. Uh, I appreciate your effort and on behalf of all of the Law Society leadership express uh, our deep gratitude for the time and the energy that you devote to the Law Society. Uh, I'm super excited for this evening's remarks. Uh, we have some great speakers here and, and I look forward to learning at their feet and look forward to interacting with you and hope that you We'll interact with each other and make great connections over the next few days. And with that, uh, I will turn the time over to our next person. Thank you. Good evening, friends. It's my great privilege tonight to uh, present the J. Clifford Wallace Award to a friend and to a jurist that I really look up to. Uh, in 2018, the J. Reuben Clark Law Society created the J. Clifford Wallace Award to honor distinguished jurists who have contributed to the cause of justice beyond their office. 
The award is named for Judge Cliff Wallace of San Diego. Judge Wallace was appointed to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of California in 1970 and to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in 1972. He served as Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals from 1991 to 1996 and continues to serve as a Senior Circuit Judge on that court at the age of 95. During his distinguished career, Judge Wallace worked with judges in more than 70 countries around the world to foster judicial independence, improve judicial administration, and promote the rule of law. A recipient of the J. Clifford Wallace Award must exemplify the mission statement of the judges uh, chapter of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. We are dedicated to promoting the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary as a cornerstone of government. We strive to assist of each other and all judges everywhere to uphold and promote these ideals. The award seeks to recognize jurists who have demonstrated professional distinction, personal integrity, and service to the administration of justice beyond the judge's ordinary responsibilities. Prior recipients of the Wallace Award include former Utah Chief Justice Christine Durham, former Chief Justice Jelani of Pakistan, Senior Judge Dave Campbell of the U.S. District Court for Arizona, and Senior Judge Bernice Donald of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. We are pleased to announce the 2024 recipient of the J. Clifford Wallace Award is Judge Denise Lindbergh of Utah. Judge Lindbergh was born in Havana, Cuba, and raised in Puerto Rico and New York. She recalls that when her family left Cuba, they lost everything. She entered Brigham Young University at 15, graduating in journalism at 19. She worked several years providing counseling and testing and rehabilitation, mental health and addiction services. She earned an MS in educational psychology, a master in social work and a PhD in health sciences, all from the University of Utah. She worked for several years as a policy analyst for the Utah State Office of Education before entering law school. Judge Lindbergh graduated magna cum laude from the J. Reuben Clark Law School, graduating second in her class in 1988. She then clerked for Judge Monroe McKay on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, and then Justice Sandra Day O'Connor the U.S. Supreme Court. She practiced in Washington, D.C. with Sidley and Austin and Hogan and Hardston, returning to Utah as General Counsel for Human Affairs International. In 1988, 1998, she was appointed by Utah Governor Mike Levitt to a seat on the 3rd Judicial District Court, where she served for 16 years until her uh, retirement from full-time judicial service in 2014. She served as an advisor on the Model Penal Code Sentencing Project for the American Law Institute and on a project on mediation and case management in the Dominican Republic. She has served on the Young Women's General Board of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and on the Board of Trustees of LDS Family Services. In 2018, Judge Lindbergh and her husband, Neil, who also graduated from BYU Law School, were called to serve as the representatives for LDS Charities at the Organization of American States. She has spoken broadly on religious liberty, professional responsibility, and the role of women throughout Latin America, Spain, and Nigeria. Judge Lindbergh and Neil are the parents of two sons, grandparents of 11, and great-grandparents of one. We're pleased to celebrate Judge Lindbergh for her substantial contributions to the bench and bar and to her community. Would you please join us in honoring Judge Denise Lindbergh as this year's J. Clifford Wallace Award recipient. We got versions. Well, all guys. When Jay Bybee called and told me that he had good news and maybe not so good news, um, 
I, uh, I was truly surprised and honored at the thought that uh, my colleagues would extend this honor. Um, having worked with Cliff, uh, for any and all of you that have had that experience, you know that he is the Energizer Bunny. And um, at 95, he does not slow down. Maybe just a little bit. Um, but Cliff's, um, as I stepped down from full-time service, said, oh, I have just, just a thing for you. You speak Spanish, and we don't have very many uh, around that can serve and do some volunteer work with um, helping on mediation and case management. So I've got just a spot for you. So through Cliff, I had the, the blessing and the opportunity to spend, I guess, three and a half years uh, off and on uh, with the Dominican Republic National Judicial College. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of working in, in Ukraine and um, in quite a few other places. Um, but it is a blessing to be able to, um, to use the, the skills and the experience and, and whatever else the Lord has given me in, um, in his service and in service of something I feel very strongly about, and that's the rule of law. So I am honored to, um, to receive this gift, this, this award in recognition, uh, to have it carry Cliff's name. Uh, it makes it incredibly special, and I am just very thankful to the judges' uh, chapter and to all of you, my colleagues, thank you very much. Do we have something else, or would you like me to just proceed? Just proceed. Okay, well, you get to hear a bit more from me today. Um, At last year's annual conference, the participants examined the question of who is my neighbor from the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this year, we return to that parable to explore and consider the meaning of the, Jesus' parting words to the lawyer, and that is, go and do thou likewise. My message to you tonight is that the skills that we've developed through our legal education and our practice experience. Give us the means and the opportunity to make a meaningful difference for good in society and in the world and to, as we accept the Lord's charge to go and do likewise. But before I turn fully to that topic, I want to take us in a couple of little um, detours. If I hope you'll bear with me as I, um, take you through uh, and explore some preliminary issues that the, that the parable raised for me. So I begin with a lawyer whose questions to Jesus began the, script, the scriptural account. Next, I will address why the other characters in the story may have acted as they did and what we learn from the Samaritan. And finally, I will discuss the ways in which I believe our legal training has given us unique skills with which we can answer the Lord's directive. Many years ago, my husband and I bought a Volkswagen Rabbit. Until then, I had paid very little attention to the make of vehicles that I passed on the road each day. Suddenly, however, it seemed that everywhere I looked, there was a VW Rabbit. Now, I'm granted those were pretty popular cars at the time, but I really don't think that unlike their flesh and blood namesakes, the VW rabbits had not multiplied exponentially in the weeks following our car purchase. What had happened was that I had become sensitized to see, looking for them, and so I saw them. 
I had a similar experience when I began to study law. And the scriptural references to law lawyers gained a salience for me that I had not given it before. And I realized how few of those references painted lawyers in a positive light. And that troubled me. So I began looking into it. And I found the fo following helpful explanation. And I quote, in everyday speech, we use the term lawyer to mean an attorney, one who represents another in a legal courtroom. The Bible, however, attaches a different meaning to the word, a religious one. When you encounter the word lawyer in the scriptures, concentrate on the law root. The law here is the Mosaic law and the codified system of rules and regulations meant to govern Israel. A lawyer, therefore, was an expert and a scholar of Mosaic law, comparable to a doctor of theology, a very learned man in Jewish religion and skilled in interpreting and applying the Mosaic law. Our Bible dictionary's entry for lawyer adds that, quote, in the New Testament, the terms is equivalent to scribe, one who by profession is a student and teacher of the written law of the Pentateuch and also of the traditions of the elders. Now the phrase traditions of the elders is not defined further, but other scholarly sources refer to it as the oral Torah, a series of rabbinical debates and elaborations on Mosaic law known as the Mishnah, and to subsequent interpretive comments, commentary on the Mishnah called the Gemara. And to together, the Mishnah and the Gemara form the Talmud. And that is, in Orthodox Judaism, considered just as binding as the written law. Now, in short, the lawyer who addressed Jesus was a religious scholar, a student of Mosaic law and of subsequent rabbinical interpretations, not a lawyer as we understand that term today. Now, the next detour I want to take you on, it could, briefly, it concerns the characterization of the, of the lawyer's motives. I think most of us would agree that when in our work we come across ambiguous terms, it's helpful to examine how those terms were used at the time that the text was drafted. As we know, the story of the Good Samaritan begins with a certain lawyer stood up and tempted Jesus by asking what he must do to inherit eternal life. I suspect many of us have read that passage and without giving much thought to how the word tempted was used at the time that Luke wrote his, his, uh, his record. Obviously, no one knows exactly what was in the mind of that lawyer when he approached Jesus with his questions. But biblical scholarship indicates that the word tempted meant something other than how we understand that term today. The first synonym for the word tempt in the Bible dictionary is to test, to try, to prove. Another scholar indicates that there were many similar instances of rabbinical writings of meetings between great teachers of the law when each tried to involve the other in dialectical, dialectic difficulties and subtle disputations about what the law meant. And that was part of essential part of rabbinical practice at the time. So knowing that debating Mosaic law was a common practice among religious scholars, and that this lawyer likely was a religious expert, the question to Jesus acquires a somewhat less pejorative uh, inference. At a minimum, as I admit, we have insufficient evidence to infer uh, an evil motive. Now, what this detour taught me was that as I study the scriptures, I need to be mindful of how word usage have changed over millennia so that I'm not grafting today's understandings onto biblical biblical text. Now for many of you, some of, some of or, or all of what I've said may not be news to you. But for me, it brought new insights into who the lawyers were of the times, why the scribes, Pharisees, and lawyers were so frequently criticized by Jesus. I found particularly instructive one writer's observations that Jesus' frequent use of the word woe in reference to lawyers and scribes and Pharisees, was that he was reflecting his sorrow over how centuries of rabbinical practice 
had distorted the Jews' understanding of God's commandments. Now, I'm turning now to the principles of compassion and mercy taught by the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I'm speaking to you as a Latter-day Saint Christian, but the sacred books of all three great uh, Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all teach that we are to love God and all who would be our neighbor. Latter-day Saints are taught that love, compassion, and mercy animated the Father's plan of happiness and the redemptive mission of Jesus Christ. One of the key tasks of mortality is to learn these principles for ourselves and to incorporate them into our lives. Elder Marion D. Hanks taught that until we understand compassion and mercy in a very personal way, it is to us, quote, no more useful or virtuous than impersonal faith, impersonal repentance, or impersonal love. In other words, knowing about mercy and compassion is not enough. To be of redemptive worth, that knowledge must guide how we act each day. In 2019, Catholic theologian John O'Callaghan delivered a masterful presentation in which he traced the evolution of Christian understanding of compassion and mercy. O'Callaghan explained that initially those terms generally were used to explain God's relationship to men. Over time, however, that understanding evolved and the usage shifted to explaining from God's, from explaining God's grace towards human beings, very fallible human beings, to explaining how human beings respond to when they witness to each other, when they witness another suffering. O'Callaghan points to the parable of the Good Samaritan as a scriptural model of what he calls the compassionate mercy in the image and likeness of God. Now the King James Version of the Bible refers to the, par to the parable's unfortunate traveler as a he. But according to O'Callaghan, in neither the Greek nor the Latin early accounts was the person who was accosted by thieves on the road to Jericho ever described with any degree of particularity. O'Callaghan speculated that the reason for this was that it did not matter whether the person in need was, quote, a man or a woman, a Jew or a Greek, a Roman or a Samaritan, close quote. What mattered was that there was a suffering human being and a second being who was moved by compassion and acted mercifully to alleviate the suffering to the extent possible. Now, in the parable, the Samaritan never questions who the injured one is, nor does he ever weigh what rendering aid may cost him. Instead, he goes to the rescue, attends to the injured person's or injured one's wounds, transports him to safety, spends a long night personally ministering to his needs, and when the Samaritan must depart, he arranges for the wounded person to be provided the care that he needs. None of the Samaritan's actions provided him any personal benefit. In fact, if anything, the opposite was true. It was compassion at the sight of an injured person that compelled the Samaritan to act and bring relief to one who was suffering. Now, according to some other scholars, in questioning Jesus about who is my neighbor, the lawyer was giving voice to an issue that greatly preoccupied the rabbinical establishment of the time, because the answer to that question dictated what obligations to another, if any, were created under Jewish canonical law. And I think you're going to be talking about the law of obliga obligations, so I won't take, take your, steal your thunder. But over the centuries, hyper-technical rabbinical elaborations of God's covenant of God's covenant to make of Abraham's children um, his chosen people had created a very proud society that was disdainful of non-Jews. Perhaps that is why in the parable neither the priest nor the Levites stopped to render aid. Instead, they crossed to the other side. Given that background, we can probably imagine the thought process 
of the priest or the Levite upon seeing this injured person. Who is this person? How did he come to be? Is he a friend or is he foe? Having been stripped of his raiment and of all his possessions, there were no clues to identify, you know, and identify him as, as a Jew. Without clues to go on, it's understandable why neither one would have felt a duty to render aid. After all, why intervene and perhaps risk incurring personal danger or even, even worse, exposure to a heathen? Now, from the lawyer's initial question to Jesus about how to achieve eternal life, we can infer that he was a Pharisee because the Pharisees believed in resurrection, whereas the Sadducees did not. The Pharisees were strict in their interpretation of Mosaic law and the oral traditions of the elders. And in their quest for purity, they separated themselves from any potential source of defilement. So, as the parable begins, the Pharisee lawyer would have completely understood and likely would have agreed with the actions of the priest or the Levite. But after the parable, the lawyer could not avoid the obvious answer to the very question that he had put to Jesus. Who is my neighbor? He that showed mercy. With this parable, Jesus was challenging those pharisaical practices that gave exclusive attention to the letter of the law, but in the process had destroyed the meaning and the spirit of the law. A Pharisee lawyer could not have possibly missed the anti-rabbinical message of the parable. In the lawyer's reluctance to even utter the word Samaritan, we also see the enmity that existed between Samaritans and Jews. Given the Jews' disdain for Samaritans then, isn't it interesting that in three separate accounts of Jesus' ministry, a Samaritan is at the center of the story. The Good Samaritan is held up as an example of mercy and compassionate ser service. When Jesus healed the 10 lepers, it was the Samaritan the only one who returned to give thanks and praise God for the cleansing miracle. And it was to a Samaritan woman with a checkered history that the Jesus for the first time publicly declared his messiahship. These cannot be coincidences. I believe that they reflect Jesus' rebuke of Judaic self-importance and its narrow and formalistic understanding of the law. In these three examples, we also see two other lessons. First, that love rather than duty is the true foundation of God and of love of God and of his works and of his laws. Second, that the gospel message is for everyone without exception. Now, anyone, switching now back to Co and do thou likewise, anyone who currently is or in the past has been a law student should recognize familiar patterns in the interactions between Jesus and the lawyer. We see how Jesus responds in Socratic fashion to the questions from, you know, from the lawyer and answers questions with questions of his own, thereby leading the, the, the lawyer to provide the answer to come out of his own mouth. Jesus then illustrates the lesson he's trying to teach with a hypothetical worthy of a law, law school final exam. And twice during the lesson, Jesus instructs the lawyer to show his mastery of the principles by living in a manner consistent with what he knows. Now the message of the parable is clear. We are to be merciful and compassionate when we see another suffering and to do what we can to alleviate it. Now writing on compassion in the practice of law this year's conference chair and BYU law professor, Christine Gerdin, expressed beautifully how critical, how, sorry, I skipped a page, how compassion enhances rather than detracts from legal practice. She quoted the following statement by Sharon Salzberg to answer the concern that compassion in the practice of law could be seen as a weakness. 
And I quote, compassion is not at all weak. It is strength that arises out of seeing the true nature of suffering in the world. Compassion allows us to bear witness of that suffering, whether it is in ourselves or others without fear. It allows us to name injustice without hesitation, to act strongly with all the skill at our disposal. Now, as Professor Gertie goes on to explain, and I quote again, compassion, compassionate lawyers can hardly be restrained from trying to render assistance and to bring healing when they witness suffering, pain, and other injustice, close quote. Her observation leads me to my last point. Jesus told the lawyer to go and do. These are verbs that call upon us to take affirmative action to serve others. In a 2012 General Conference talk, President Linda K. Burton, who was then serving as General Relief Society president, elegantly summarized a useful approach for all of us to follow when she said, first observe, then serve. Isn't that, after all, what the Samaritan did? He observed a need, and he responded by serving the, the injured man, even though it probably was not convenient nor fit into his plans. President Burton's formulation offers simple and effective guidance for people of all faiths. But as lawyers, I believe we can and, do sh and, sh and should do more. The skills we've developed through our legal education and practice provide us with the opportunity and the responsibility to strengthen society and make this a better world. Now, setting aside for a moment the substantive knowledge that we develop in practice, our strengths are, lie mostly in process skills, analytical re reasoning, critical thinking, persuasive advocacy, priority setting, just to name a few. To that list, I would add a couple of other critical but rarely mentioned skills of, that I think bear mentioning here, listening carefully and communicating clearly. It is difficult. These are all difficult skills to explain, but they become obvious when one observes a really talented lawyer at work. Now, almost 75 years ago, a prominent New York City lawyer, John W. Davis, described the lawyer's work as follows. Quote, true, we build no bridges. We raise no towers. We construct no engines. We paint no pictures unless it's for our own, as, as amateurs, for our own amusement. There is little of what we do which the eye of man can see. But we smooth out difficulties. We relieve stress. We correct mistakes. We take up other men's burdens. And by our efforts, we make possible a peaceful life in a peaceful state. Now, what an elegant statement of what a good lawyer does. So I'd like to take us through each of those points a little for a little bit here. Lawyers smooth out difficulties. As a general proposition, people seek out lawyers because they currently are facing or anticipate facing legal issues that could imperil their personal or family's welfare, assets, or even life. Freedom. The trigger may be a financial crisis, a divorce, a criminal charge, an eviction, or some other problem. Even when there's no immediate crisis, lawyers help clients assess risk, anticipate problems, explore solutions, and put them into effect. Whether a lawyer is acting as counselor, negotiator, mediator, or, or advocate, lawyers are society's problem sol solvers. We smooth out difficulties. Lawyers relieve stress. Both in my law practice and as a judge, I saw emotional toll that legal proceedings will take on litigants and their families. Court cases are time consuming, they're expensive, often consume, confusing, even for those familiar with court processes. Often the resulting stress can be immobilizing. At a J. Reuben Clark Law Society fireside in 2003, President James E. Faust spoke of the satisfaction that he experienced from helping what he called 
just come on folk, who would arrive at his office distraught and anguished. President Faust noted how a simple reassuring statement, I think we can get this straightened out, lifted his client's spirits. In my law practice, I represented large institutional healthcare providers. I did my best to serve them competently, but it was in pro bono service on behalf of individuals that I found real satisfaction. I remember how rewarding it was to see my clients' fears and anxiety turn to understanding and a degree of peace. Years later, as a judge, I became a target of a lawsuit challenging judgments that I had entered in a case. It was then that I really came to understand just how emotionally draining being a party in a lawsuit can be. I understood how the system worked, but even then, there were times when stress tied up my stomach in knots. I'll forever be grateful for the skill and dedication of two appellate partners at my old, former law firm, whose pro bono representation of me for two years culminated in a Tenth Circuit judgment dismissing the case against me. I know that lawyers can relieve stress. Lawyers correct mistakes. Let's face it, in law as in life, mistakes happen. Our legal system is good, but it's not perfect. People fall through the cracks. Sometimes justice fails with tragic consequences. Examples abound of systemic problems that undermine the promise of equal justice under law. It can be a depressing thing to consider, which is why I appreciate good lawyers who have made and continue to make a difference for good in our society. Among their numbers, I count the lawyers at the time of this country's founding who had the vision and crafted a framework of a new and untested form of government and then inspired others to believe that it was possible. In those ranks, I also include thoughtful lawmakers who work to improve communities in which we live and crusading lawyers like those whose work in innocence projects across the, world, the country had, as of this past December 2023, secured the freedom of 249 wrongly convicted persons, many of whom were in death row. And let us not forget the thousands of lawyers who on a daily basis and without fanfare help clients solve their own and others' mistakes. Perhaps some of you have ever missed, uh, visited Monroe Elementary School it was one of four segregated schools, elementary schools in Topeka, Kansas, that were at issue in Brown versus Board of Education. Today, it's a national historic site, but the separate drinking fountains marked for colored and for whites only are still there. They're reminders of the indignities that were once accepted as normal and just the way things are. I spent an afternoon there some time ago. I can't fully convey just how moving it was to see what Thurgood Marshall and his small band of lawyers at the NAACP had fought for and accomplished. I have never been so proud to be a lawyer. As few others can, Lawyers help correct mistakes. Lawyers take up other men's burdens. Members of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society in chapters throughout the world render untold hours of pro bono service every year. Through your service, you take up other people's burdens in very real and meaningful ways. As a district court judge, I held regularly scheduled unlawful detainer calendars. Landlords were usually represented by counsel. Practically none of the defendants were. 
Some could not read English well enough to even understand the summonses or their legal obligations. They had no prior experience with the system. Frequently, these defendants worked full time and earned only minimum wage. Many, in fact, worked more than job, one job just to make ends meet. Many worked untold hours. Then a cascading set of events would cause them to default on their rent. Often it was an illness, either their own or that of a family member. Because they were ill, they had no insurance, but they had no insurance coverage. But because they were ill, they missed too much work. They missed too much work and they lost their jobs. Without employment, what little money they had ran out before the expenses did. When they came to court, they were scared. Now each week, a few lawyers would come to my courtroom to volunteer limited representation of those defendants. Meeting in the hallway bef before their, um, you know, the case was called, they had only a few minutes to try to negotiate an orderly and dignified process for surrender of the premises. Sometimes those efforts fell on deaf ears, leaving me no option but to grant the landlord representative's motion for entry of judgment for the full amount of default, plus triple damages and attorney's fees as authorized by law. Today, I acknowledge and I pay tribute to those few landlord representatives who without disadvantaging their clients, forbore from pressing every single advantage available to them that was available under Utah law. I hope they realize what difference their small courtesies made to those defendants. Lawyers make possible a peaceful life in a peaceful state. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, one by one, the former Soviet satellite states declared their independence. Members of the American Law Institute, the American Bar Association, and others with expertise in constitutional law and in other areas of, of law responded for the calls for assistance. They traveled to the former Soviet bloc countries and lent their expertise to the task of writing new constitutions for those newly independent states. Today, we see the results of those efforts in way that democratic principles have taken root and the law, rule of law have taken root in places like Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and others. BYU's own Cole Durham was among those pioneering experts. I remember being thrilled for the citizens of those countries as they took their first tentative steps towards democratic rule. There was a sense of excitement in the air that was almost palpable. Not unexpectedly, there have been ups and downs in the ensuing 35 years since those early days of promise. Today, there are worrying signs of backsliding because of economic difficulties and the rise of authoritarian leaders. As we know all too well from our own country's struggle, democracies are fragile. The rule of law does not long survive without constant attention to protecting and reinforcing democratic principles and the basic institutions of society. Skilled and righteous lawyers, excuse me, committed to the rule of law are the bulwark against tyranny. We make possible a peaceful life in a peaceful state. In closing, I leave with you this challenge. As people of faith, let us serve our neighbors with love, mercy, and compassion. As lawyers, let us use our skills to smooth out difficulties, relieve stress, correct mistakes, lift other people's burdens, and that by doing so, 
we will make possible a peaceful life in a peaceful state. Let us answer this challenge. Excuse me. In our hearts. And and in our daily conduct, committed, as it says in Micah, to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's now uh, my privilege to introduce our concluding speaker, speaker for tonight, uh, Judge Jay Bybee, who was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in 2003 by President George W. Bush. He served previously, prior to that, he served as Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice and also was a law professor here at William S. Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he's my friend, and it's a great privilege that we have to hear from him tonight. Judge Bybee. Okay, this okay. Okay. About 25 years ago, my wife Diana and I came to Las Vegas where I was um, part of the founding faculty of the new William S. Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to teach civil procedure and administrative law and constitutional law. Shortly after we arrived in Las Vegas, I found myself in conversation with an ophthalmologist friend. I asked him if I could put some questions to him about LASIK surgery and told him that in exchange for his advice, I'd be willing to offer my legal services to him. What can you do for me, he asked. Well, I said, if one day you get home and find that you have troops quartered in your house and not under rules provided for by Congress, call me. I'll, I'll come over and read them the Third Amendment. We'll get it all straightened out. Or if one Saturday night, you and the wife end up in an argument and she has taken a completely unreasonable position about whether the police can search your cell phone during a Terry stop. Again, you call me. I'll come right over even if it's late. We'll read the Fourth Amendment together, talk about the cases, and work at reconciling your positions. It's nice to belong to a helping profession. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you tonight, and it's really an honor to be on the program with Judge Lindbergh. It's a marvelous talk, um, and um, uh, I hope that nothing that I say will detract in any way from what uh, Denise has told us uh, tonight. It is, in fact, good to belong to a helping profession. Sometimes we just need to have some clarity about who we're helping and why. I suspect that you invited me here tonight because I'm a judge on the Ninth Circuit and not because I teach high school juniors and seniors in Sunday school. Generally, I try to keep those two colleagues separate. Tonight, you may get a little bit from both sides. I'm going to let my experience as a Sunday school teacher inform my understanding of American jurisprudence. And I'm going to let my experience as a lawyer, professor, and judge inform my understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The conference organizers have selected as a theme for the conference, go and do thou likewise. Let's see, did that work? Good. That is the tagline to the parable of the Good Samaritan, one of the great parables of the New Testament. You know the story, but let's review how it began. Judge Lindbergh covered some of this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, 
what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said to him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So far, so good. The lawyer answered that one must love the Lord with all one's heart, mind, uh, strength, and soul. That law was derived from the first commandment and memorialized in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and is the first part of the Jewish Shema. The second part of the law recited by the lawyer, the part about loving thy neighbor as thyself, is what we know as the golden rule. It also comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. From that auspicious start, Luke records that the lawyer pressed Jesus, perhaps to test Jesus' knowledge of the law of Moses. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You know how the story proceeds from there. Jesus tells the story of a man who was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was beset by thieves and left half dead on the side of the road. Three people uh, passed by after him. Three people passed after him, a priest of the temple at Jerusalem, a Levite uh, who would have assisted the priest, and a Samaritan. Either out of cowardice or callousness, the priest and Levite crossed the road at the sight of the man and continue on their way. Only the Samaritan stops, binds the man's wounds, and carries him to an inn where the Samaritan pays for the man's care. Then Jesus asks, now which one of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? The lawyer answered, he that shewed mercy on him. Hence Jesus' charge, go and do thou likewise. Such a simple question, who is my neighbor? Yet Jesus' parable confounds at every turn. Jesus' reference to the Samaritan was the first curve. The Samaritans and the Jews had a complex relationship, sometimes tolerant of each other and sometimes enemies. The Samaritans were the remnants of the ten tribes who occupied the northern kingdom of Israel, with Samaria as its capital. They had been conquered by the Assyrians some 120 years uh, before the Babylonians conquered the kingdom of Judah. The Samaritans worshipped Jehovah and had the Pentateuch, but they did not recognize Jerusalem as the proper site for the temple, but believed the true site was Mount Gezerim. Gerizim, I'm sorry. There were many points of commonality between the Samaritans and the Jews, but there were many points of contention as well. If Jesus was going to introduce a Samaritan character into his parable, why didn't he make the, the, the Samaritan the victim? Wouldn't a Samaritan victim have answered the, the lawyer's question and dramatically? Why did the Samaritan need to be the hero of the parable rather than its victim? That leads us to the second curve. The lawyer was expecting Jesus to tell him who was his neighbor. Might the lawyer have thought that the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself did not include non-Jews? Might he have expected Jesus to offer various qualifiers about not having to help one's neighbor if it meant endangering one's own life, or deterred one from an even more momentous obligation? Rather than explore such legal nuances, Jesus didn't answer the question the lawyer thought he had asked. Instead, Jesus answered a different question. Not what kind of people ought we to help, but what kind of people do the helping? Jesus asked the lawyer which of the three men was the better neighbor. That prompts an answer to a very different question. Jesus did not focus on the recipient as our neighbor, but on the offeror as a good neighbor. The lawyer had asked the question as though he was the one in the position to help. Jesus answered the lawyer as though the lawyer were the victim rather than the savior. The lawyer had inquired into the scope of the commandment. Jesus offered insight into how it was to be fulfilled. Christ's reframing invites us to return to the question that prompted the parable. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Why was the lawyer posing that question? His inquiry seems to cast aspersions on our profession, suggesting that as lawyers we are so ignorant of the things of eternity that we have to go around asking what we should do. I don't think his, inqu his inquiry was so unthinking. The reason the lawyer was asking the question is, I submit, straightforward enough. But it will require us to think about the nature of the law, and in particular, the, the nature of Jewish law, 
and American jurisprudence. Let's start with some fundamentals about the American system. We are a rights-based legal system. When a plaintiff sues a defendant, the plaintiff seeks to vindicate his rights. Whether the rights sound in tort, contract, or property, whether they are founded in the common law, statutory or regulatory law, or the remedies created to enforce our constitutional rights, whether they are asserted against private parties, the state or federal government, or persons acting under color of law, we are all about our rights. Although we have not been precise in our terminology, there is a strong logic to the way in which our rights are structured. The most influential expositor of the school of thought known as analytical jurisprudence was the young Yale law professor, Wesley Hofeld. Hofeld argued that all legal relationships could be expressed in eight terms, right, privilege, power, immunity, duty, no right, liability, and disability. One of Hofeld's insights was to show that legal relationships, as opposed to other kinds of relationships, such as uh, moral relationships, are binary. That is, they require at least two people. To say that Joe owes $10, I, um, I'm sorry, to say that Steve is owed $10 does not express a legal relationship. To say that Joe owes $10, likewise, is not a legal statement. For Hofeld, it was nonsense to say that Steve had a right to $10 unless there was someone who owed him $10. Steve has a right to $10 if and only if there exists someone, Joe perhaps, who owes $10 to Steve. In Hofeld's nomenclature, Steve has a right if and only if Joe has a duty. Rights and duties are what Hofeld referred to as jural correlatives. They are always found in pairs. In our system, rights and duties do not exist independent of each other. Where someone has a legal right, someone else has a legal duty. Where someone has a legal duty, someone else has a legal right. But that does not mean that we value rights and duties equally. We clearly do not. Indeed, for most of us, we really only care about our legal rights. Oh, we may think about our legal duties, but when we do, we are largely in defensive mode. We are not focused on what we ought to do, legally or morally, but on what we have to do to stay out of court. We have adopted a minimalist approach to our legal duties. Our approach to our legal duties, by contrast, is often maximalist. Uh, we want every penny uh, from those who, can, we, who have damaged our property, committed tort upon us, or breached our contracts. When Ronald Dworkin wrote Taking Rights Seriously, he recognized the corrected concepts of legal right and legal, legal obligation. But he was really only interested in one side of the equation. It is only rights that we take seriously. Yet Dworkin also acknowledged that a theory that takes rights as fundamental is a theory of a different character from one that takes duties as fundamental. Dworkin explained, right-based and duty-based theories place the individual at the center and take his decision or conduct as of fundamental importance. But the two types put the individual in a different light. Duty-based theories are concerned with the moral quality of his acts because they suppose that it is wrong without more for an individual to fail to meet certain standards of behavior. Right-based theories are, in contrast, concerned with the independence rather than the conformity of individual action. Duty-based theories treat codes of conduct as of the essence, whether at their center is the man who must conform to such a code or be punished or corrupted if he does not. Right-based theories, however, treat codes of conduct as instrumental, perhaps necessary to protect the rights of others, but having no essential value in themselves. The man at their center is the man who benefits from others' compliance, not the man who leads the life of virtue by complying himself. Let's think about some of the implication of a rights-based system. Um, first, a rights-based system tends toward standards rather than rules. Standards generally do not draw bright lines. They require us to consider the facts as a whole and to balance competing interests. Standards give more leeway, more room for judgment to the decision maker. Standards are more Bentham than Kant, more utilitarian than deontological. Second, because standards are less precise in their application, a rights-based society is court-centered. Our courts are the focus of American law. 
Although our legislatures wield impressive power over our lives and the apparatus of the executive branches is enormous and affects us daily, the influence of the judicial branch is outsized. In the American legal system, the influence to budget ratio favors the judiciary because that is where rights are adjudicated. Almost all our litigation is instigated by the party claiming the right. Rights holders in America are plaintiffs. Duty holders in our system are almost always defendants. I say almost because we have devices such as interpleader and counterclaims that may require some rearranging of the party designations. But so pervasive is our rights-based focus that even defendants will couch their defenses in terms of rights. They will seek to cast themselves as rights holders as well. I had a right not to do X, so I didn't do it. Third, rights-based systems reinforce rights at the expense of duties. We Americans love winners, and rights holders are winners. I'm going to be approximate here, so don't hold me to the, to the math, but about one half of the parties in cases in my court go home disappointed. And the losers do not accept defeat gracefully. Oh, I don't mean that they file petitions for rehearing or rehearing en banc or file petitions for certiorari in the Supreme Court. Those are just part of the system. What I mean is, at the end of the day, no party to litigation ever considers themselves to have been in the wrong. An unfavorable decision by a court forces the parties to seek a new forum, maybe on the courthouse steps or in the Twitterverse. We have an enormous capacity for blaming the lawyers, the judges, and the juries for our defeat. Judgments are paid, but only begrudgingly. Judgments in American courts are coercive judgments, enforceable through garnishment, levies, fines, and contempt proceedings. Such judgments are enforceable not only in the court issuing the judgment, but in courts throughout the United States through the full faith and credit clause of the US Constitution. It is no wonder that lawyers in the United States are simultaneously held in both high regard and high contempt. Depending on whose ox is being gored, they are our champions or our tormentors. We can see these consequences of a right-centric apparatus at work and how the parable of the Good Samaritan has influenced the development of American law. The common law generally recognized no duty to rescue a stranger and, in fact, created disincentives for rescue by imposing, imposing liability for negligent rescue. The common law's only exceptions were in recognition of special relationships between the victim and the bystander, in which case the bystander could be held liable for failure to assist the one in need. Recognizing the perversity of this situation, California passed the first Good Samaritan statute in 1959. It operated by providing immunity from liability for rescuers. That is, it created a defense in tort if the rescuer is sued. The model proliferated and similar statutes were eventually adopted by all the states. Many of these statutes seem to have been responsive to high-profile incidents where, where potential rescuers did not give aid to helpless persons. These statutes did not impose a duty of rescue. They simply removed a legal disincentive to perform the rescue. This suggests a modern explanation for the parable. One of the great mysteries of Christ's parable is why the priest and the Levite passed by, while the Samaritan did not. Some have suggested that they may have feared that handling the body would have rendered them ritually unclean. Others suggest that the priest and the Levite feared that if they stopped, the thieves might rob them as well and there was no duty to rescue if it put one's own life at risk. But if the priest and the Levite were in America, there would be no doubt as to why they behaved as they did. The priest and the Levite whipped out their cell phones and called Levitical counsel. And counsel advised them to avoid the man lest they handle him negligently. The last time this happened, counsel told them, the whole tribe of Levi was held liable under theories of respondeat superior and failure to train. Jewish law, by contrast, was a duty-based system. The covenants between God and Abraham on Mount Moriah and between Moses and God on Mount Sinai made the Israelites God's chosen people. But in return, the covenant required God's chosen people to obey God's law. The law not only included forms for worshiping God found in the first four commandments, but the ways in which God's people were expected to treat each other found in the last six commandments. Hence the lawyer's answer to Jesus, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. The first response described the lawyer's duty to God, the second his duty to others. The law of Moses was exacting in the way it required people to treat each other. Yale professor Robert Cover has referred to the Jewish duty as mitzvah, which he translates as incumbent obligation. 
Following Hofeld's analysis, the law of Moses can be described, uh, even as we describe American law, in terms of rights and duties. The eye for an eye represented retribution when the one who damaged the eye failed to make the recompense prescribed by the law of Moses. But just as American law values rights, the law of Moses emphasized duties or obligations. If American law would say a plaintiff has a right not to be punched in the nose, Jewish law would have begun with the putative defendant who had a duty not to harm others. There are a number of consequences of a duty-based approach. First, duty-based law tends to become rule-oriented. While the common law prizes standards based on all the facts, Jewish law tended to formulate precise rules well-suited to self-application. Thus, over time, a duty-based system leads to more refined rules so that we can obey the law with exactness. The excesses of that rule-based rule approach are a theme running through Christ's criticism of the Pharisees. The Apostle Paul characterized the New Testament as one of spirit over letter, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Second, in a duty-based system, the idea of coercive judgments nearly disappears. A duty-based system is not frictionless, but it requires a far more modest state apparatus to render and enforce its judgments. A Jewish petition was a common request for clarification by people willing to perform their duty once made known to them. That is, instead of a plaintiff's complaint and summons, which is followed by the defendant's answer denying all liability and then exchanges of interrogatories, depositions, and requests for discovery, the Jewish petition was a joint petition to a judge to ask for a declaration of the law so that the parties knew exactly what they were supposed to do. Perhaps one party was right and the other was wrong. Perhaps both were wrong. But the parties accepted the judgment as a definitive declaration of their respective obligations under the law. Third, the judgment remains important, but the room for resentment and criticism of the system is reduced. The judge is there to resolve a conflict over the party's obligations, not resolve colliding rights. As Israeli lawyer Amud ben, um, Amahud ben Porath explains, the judge was not an umpire between adversaries. Rather, he was best qualified to tell the parties what behavior the law prescribed for them, so as to prevent the erring party from committing a sin. Thus exhorts the Talmud, let, he, let him who comes from a court that has taken from him his cloak to satisfy a judgment, sing his song and go his way, since having been justly tried, he had not been divested of property, but rather had been relieved from an ill-gotten object. Wouldn't I like to hear some people whistling as they go out of my court saying, boy, I'm so glad the Ninth Circuit resolved that one. I, I lost, but by golly, they must be right, and I'm going to go whistling on my way. As Latter-day Saints, we have both well-developed standards and rules, and we have had our own challenges with the balance between the two. For example, the church has recently revised its publication of For the Strength of Youth, a Guide for Making Choices, to emphasize standards of conduct over rules of conduct. On the other hand, because rules often can be measured, we prize measurable behaviors over less measurable behaviors based on standards. Hence, our late heavy emphasis on statistics and home teaching and visiting teaching. Another good example is our strong focus on the word of wisdom. Our abstention from alcohol, tobacco, and coffee and tea marks us as a peculiar people. But when we focus on measurable outward behavior, it is inevitable that we will need answers to our questions about caffeine consumption and whether Coke, tiramisu, or mocha ice cream violate the commandment. In some contexts, the need for rules over standards is predictable and advisable. With our young missionaries, we emphasize that like Helaman stripling warriors, they should obey and observe every word of command with exactness. One explanation is that a mission president is charged with governing 150 18, uh, 18 to 22 year olds who are distributed over a large geographic area. Many of those young men and young women are away from home for the first time. They are without the constraining influences of parents, resident assistants, and campus police. In a word, they must be self-governing. And one efficient way of doing that is to prescribe a set of rules to be diligently followed. We teach them correct principles or rules, and they govern themselves. Jesus' teachings deeply reflect a duty-based approach, but one that seems to honor the standards as well as the rules. Consider this saying from the Sermon on the Mount. 
If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Christ's charge emphasizes that the man who had to sue for the coat has been forced to go to law. The man who owes the coat should volunteer his cloak as penance for having failed in his obligation. Immediately after this teaching, Christ referred to the ancient status of suzerain, wherein citizens of a vassal state owed certain obligations to their overlords. Jesus referred to the practice uh, where a citizen of the vassal state could be compelled to carry the load of a citizen of the feudal state for a prescribed distance. Jesus counseled that whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Why? Wasn't it sufficient that if the vassal state citizen fulfilled his, his duty and maybe even went without complaining? Christ's challenge to go the extra mile accomplishes two things. First, it relieves a fellow citizen of the burden of carrying that load for the second mile. Second, going the extra mile is a burden-freeing act. It makes the vassal citizen existentially free because he chooses without coercion to do something for someone who perhaps does not deserve it. But in the end, it is a liberating act. Thus, Christ acknowledged duty as the beginning of discipleship, although certainly not its end. In the end, I think there is much for us to learn from the lawyer's questions to Christ. Recall that, that the colloquy began with the question we all ask, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then after the preliminary response, the neighbor sought further detail with the interrogatory, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> Insightful as those questions and their responses are, there is as much to learn from the fact of the questions as there is from their substance. The lawyer's immediate motive for asking the question may have been to test Jesus against the rabbinic commentaries, but his first question suggests that his ultimate intent was to fulfill his obligations under the law without coercion, thereby hoping to inherit eternal life. We tend to criticize or view with suspicion this scriptural archetype of our profession, but I submit that he was not so far from the kingdom of God as we assume. He understood that our peace and enjoyment in this life and in the eternal one to follow turn on the fulfillment of our duties, not merely the ability to assert rights. I therefore urge us as lawyers and as people to give proper weight to our duties and not just to our rights. By doing so, I do not mean to disparage the vindication of rights. There are times when being a rights-facing society is the correct thing to do. As Dworkin properly observes, the institution of rights is crucial because it represents the majority's promise to the minorities that their dignity and equality will be respected. I also do not wish to be naive. The conditions necessary for a duty-based society are not present in the United States and are not likely to manifest themselves for some time. We are not an ethnically or religiously insular, insular society committed to obeying God's law without the need for coercive judgments. But just as the law of consecration does not require the presence of others willing to live a united order, we do not need to be compelled in all things. We are living in an extraordinary period in American history, one that will test whether a pluralistic democratic republic can survive. I am persuaded that men and women of goodwill will need to step up. One way that we can do that is by taking this lawyer as our guide. Scholars believe that the terms lawyer and scribe as used in the New Testament refer to experts in the law whose function was to help the Jewish public understand their legal duties thoroughly they often gave their service for free, evincing greater concern for the community's legal harmony than their own profit. Done properly, the lawyer's work would obviate the need for recursion to the courts for resolution of interpersonal disputes. So in Luke's account, we see a lawyer showing himself eager to understand the precise contours of his duty under the law. And by his training and expertise, he was better enabled to encourage both client and those in his social orbit to favor fulfillment of duty over the vindication of right, to seek legal harmony through, inter through personal responsibility rather than the blaming of others. Go and do thou likewise. Thank you very much. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for this day, and we're thankful that we could all make it here. We're 
So very thankful for our speakers today, and we pray that we can take their words and apply it in our lives. And as we continue in the conference, we pray that we'll be able to learn on how we can go and do likewise in our lives and as students, as attorneys and professionals who cherish religious freedom. And our Heavenly Father, we love thee and we thank thee again for this evening. And we say and pray for all these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, they're putting the desserts out. They'll be ready in just a few minutes. We have the room until about 9 o'clock. And then just a reminder that we have breakfast tomorrow morning. Um, and then we will have our plenary session. We'll be back here again tomorrow morning. So have a wonderful evening. Enjoy yourselves. And have a good night. Hang on there.